Well, the last time I was up here for a message, it was about 10 weeks ago, which was the day of Pentecost. And so uh, that day, um, we talked about God pouring out his spirit on all mankind uh, at the day of Pentecost. That was also the first time that the church preached a message. Peter preached on that day, and he gave this call while he was preaching. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So 3,000 people came to faith that day. And 3,000 people were added to the 120 believers. And 3,000 people received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit brought in a time of wonders and signs, really extraordinary miracles that were performed by the apostles or through the apostles would be a better way to say that. And that was to attest to the message of the good news of Jesus Christ and to start his church. So that was Acts chapter two. Um, so like we do, today we'll move on to Acts chapter three. Um, and we will be in the first 10 Verses. So please stand for our scripture reading, and then if you would remain standing for our uh, morning prayer. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and enter the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who had sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So uh, usually for our morning prayer, we are working our way through Psalms. Pastor Randers, Randy started that uh, tradition long ago, and so today our, our pastoral prayer is on Psalm 51, based on that psalm. O oh God, Almighty God, our Father, it is to your great name that we come before and worship and praise. Lord, have mercy on us and have mercy on us according to your love, according to your steadfast love, because like your servant David, we need mercy. We are helpless. Helpless before you because of our sins. And it is only because of your love and your mercy that we can call on you to blot out those sins, our transgressions. So have mercy on us. 
have mercy on me and blot out my transgressions. Because I've been a sinner from birth, so wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse my sins. I know them. My sin is always before me. And it's against you that I sin. That you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. So hide your face, Lord, from my sins. Blot out my iniquities and create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away. from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And Lord, we ask that, that you open our lips and our mouths so that we can declare your praise because you don't delight in sacrifices. Burnt offerings mean nothing to you. The sacrifices you desire are a broken spirit. And you don't despise a contrite and broken heart. So Lord, have mercy on us. We need you. And today we ask you to have mercy on those in this church, in this congregation, in this family of disciples uh, who have serious and urgent medical needs. And uh, there are many of those, Lord, and you know them better than anyone. Uh, think especially of Sandy this morning. We pray that you would meet her needs along with Pat's. There is no one else. We pray these things in the great name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So the message today from Acts 3 to 1 to 10 is entitled, Giving God's Gifts. And our thesis is, the Spirit of God empowers disciples with valuable gifts for others' needs and for his praise. Tanner already mentioned that next Sunday, uh, we are going to have Living Hope Evangelical Free Church meet here with us next Sunday morning, uh, and we will be sending them off to their new home. Uh, they expect to be able to, though it's not a, a sure thing, to be able to meet the next Sunday on August 11th in their own facility for their own uh, Sunday morning service. And so next week is, is quite likely uh, the last time that we will meet together with that church for Sunday morning worship. So I hope you can come out for that. Today, Living Hope will be meeting at 4 o'clock here, as they have been. So these days, it, it's pretty uncommon to meet for worship in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, but in our story in Acts 3, uh, that's what was going on. Peter and John were going up to the temple on the ninth hour, that is three o'clock in the afternoon, the middle of the afternoon, for prayer. It was one of three hours of prayer that, that was at the temple each day. And after the, one that, the ninth hour prayer, as we got closer to evening, people who came for the hour of prayer would stay for the evening sacrifices at the temple. 
And so that would kind of be like, kind of be like Living Hope coming here at 4 o'clock and then staying around for our evening service. I hope they don't try it today, though, because we're all going to be at McKinnon Park, right? Everybody go to McKinnon Park. 6 o'clock tonight. So back to Acts 3. Our, our first point is Peter meets the lame man at the temple. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So, so most early Christians were Jews, and they were used to the custom of going to the temple to pray. And the early, early believers continued that for quite some time. Going up to the temple involved going up a stairway, a stairway that was between the outer court of the temple that was open to Gentiles and the inner courts, a series of them that were available only to Jews. And so at the top of these stairs, there would have been, there were gates. Um, one of those was completely covered with silver and gold. Herod, King Herod, you've heard of him, uh, built that temple to be magnificent along with its courtyards and to be noticeable from, from far away. And so they were going up there. It took 46 years, as you know, from other places in the gospel to build that temple, 46 years. The gate that was covered with silver and gold was most likely the one that was called the beautiful gate. Verse 2, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. So as Peter and John approached the the beautiful gate, they see the man being carried on something that was probably much like a stretcher, and he was truly disabled. He'd never walked. He had to be carried. So, so people will make all kinds of accommodations to get around, to walk. I think it was about five years ago as we were making our way to South Sudan, uh, passing through Ethiopia, I noticed a man with one leg uh, in one of the villages. And he was carrying a long trunk of a, of a narrow trunked tree that had been stripped down. It was probably about that big around. And it looked like it was way too long to me. But here's what he was doing. He was holding that stick, that pole, that tree trunk with both hands, and then he would propel himself forward to his good leg. And then he would do it again and do it again. It didn't stop him from getting around. Nobody wants to carry somebody that can get around on their own. Life is hard there, and I'm sure it was much like that uh, in the ancient world. But the man in Acts 3 had never walked. He was lame from birth. He couldn't use the trunk of a tree because his feet and his ankles didn't work. And so he couldn't work either. He didn't have the option of working from his computer at home. And there were no GoFundMe pages. And there were no ADA accommodations. And apparently his family couldn't provide for him either. 
because he had to be carried by, by family or friends to beg because that was the only way that he could survive. Asking alms of those entering the temple. So that means asking for money from people out of mercy or out of pity. And the gate between the temple courts was the best place for him to be because three times a day, people went up there and so they dropped him there. They put him there to beg for money. His friends or his family had to bring him there and lay him beside that, that gate. So it was probably quite common when you went to worship to run across people like that, people that were truly in need. And, and really, it's not much different from, from today. Uh, I have a friend who a few years ago visited the Vatican. And the things that he remembered most was he was just shocked by the display of gold uh, at, the, at the Vatican, kind of like the beautiful gate. And just outside the Vatican, people with no limbs, lame people, asking for alms. Like Peter and like John, when we come to worship, we are going to encounter people who are in real need. They might not be quite the same kind of needs as the lame man had, but they're real. They're real needs. And they might be outside the doors, but most likely they're inside them. Martin Luther is famed for many, famous for, for many things. One of the ones most impressive to me is that he wrote in his lifetime about 60,000 pages. Just, just think about that. 60,000 pages he wrote, and we have access to quite a few of those works that, that Luther wrote. But he's also famous for a small piece of paper that he had in his pocket on his deathbed. He had, he had written these words. We are all beggars. This is true. So countless messages have been preached and, and many, many articles have been written based on Luther's words. We are all beggars. This is true. And it is true, because on our own we are completely helpless like we prayed this morning. Our only hope is for God to rescue us, for him to notice us. That's one of the reasons that we're here, really. I mean, if, if you think about it, that's really one of the reasons we're here is because we need, we have needs. We need him and we need God, what God provides. We need his help. Maybe not like the lame man, but we still do need it. And the good news is that God doesn't leave us helpless and he didn't leave the lame man helpless. Verse three, let's go back to the beautiful gate. When Peter and John are heading up the stairs and, and coming to the top of those stairs and then entering into the temple, the man spots them. And he asks for money. So I don't know if any of you have ever paid attention. I know that you've seen people begging at interstate ramps, off ramps. I don't know if you've ever paid any attention to what the other people are doing. The drivers are doing. So pretty much every day, I get off Interstate 29 at 12th Street. And, and often, especially if it's late afternoon or, or early evening, often there's a man standing outside by the, by the stoplight at the off-ramp. Most of the time, it's the same man. Sometimes he is carrying a sign that says, anything helps. 
Sometimes the sign is there, but it's just, he's just not holding it. It's nearby. But most of the drivers just look straight ahead. Or they look the other way. Or they look at their phones. They're trying to ignore him. And what he does usually is start at that stoplight and then move back to, so he can make sure he gets in sight of each person. Anybody can see him if they want to. But most people don't want to. Most people are just eager for the light to turn green so they can turn the corner and put him out of sight and out of mind. I'm not sure if that guy really needs money or not. I don't know. But the guy in Acts 3 needed money. He needed silver and gold. He needed what was on the beautiful gate. And he needed it to survive. But Peter and John don't look straight ahead. And they don't look the other way. And they don't try to ignore him. They don't like hurry through the gate so they can get him out of sight and out of mind. Instead, we see in, in verse 4, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. Well, that had to catch the guy off guard. I'm sure, I'm sure he was used to, once in a while, somebody coming by and dropping a coin or a piece of bread, maybe, in his basket. But not this. Most people probably walked right by. Most people probably looked straight ahead. Most people probably turned the other way. But Peter and John said, Look at us. They called attention to themselves. Verse 5. And so the man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. So the man had to be thrilled, shocked and thrilled. Because not only did he get their attention, they asked him for his attention. They asked him to look at them. He probably expected to get something from them, like it says. He expected to receive something from them. He expected to receive alms. He expected to receive money. He probably expected a haul. Our second point is that Peter gives the lame man what he has. Verse 6. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. So imagine the disappointment. I have no silver and gold. And he needed silver and gold, and he knew he needed silver and gold. The NIV actually puts this verse much closer to the Hebrew word order, which makes the point more emphatically in it when it says this. Silver or gold, I do not have. The man needed money. He needed silver and gold. He really, he really did need it. He needed it to live. And, and if they would have had money, they should have given it to him. If anyone coming by had had silver or gold, they should have given to it to him. It would have been wrong for them not to give it to him. But Peter couldn't give the man what he didn't have. He could only give them what he did have. And what Peter had was, was way more valuable. Way more valuable than, than silver or gold. So he says... Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. And then he adds, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. See, Peter understood that the need was greater 
than the need for silver or gold. And he knew that if the other need were met, that the need would, for silver and gold would go away. If the lame man could walk, he could have worked. And Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So I don't get the impression, I don't think you get the impression that when he says that, that Peter is going, oh boy, I hope this works. No, Peter knew what was coming next. He knew the man would be healed. God had poured out his spirit and the apostles were empowered to do wonders and great signs, magnificent things as part of Jesus' continuing ministry on earth. The Holy Spirit had empowered them to keep doing so, what, so that they could do what Jesus had been doing. And so he knew what was going to happen. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. By his great name, rise up and walk. Because in a very real sense, the lame man was healed by Jesus Christ in his work. I wonder if when Peter and John saw the lame man, they thought of the paralyzed man that Jesus healed at Capernaum. And probably all of you know this story. It's the one where he's being carried by four people, the paralyzed man, and he can't, they can't get him close to Jesus. And so what do they do? They go up to the roof and they dig a hole in the roof and they lower him down right in front of Jesus. Well, Luke wrote about that, that passage as well. And Luke writes the book of Acts. So I know it was in Luke's mind as he wrote it. And the stories really are very, very much similar. The man was healed. He walks away and the people glorify God and they're amazed. Much like is going to ha happen right here because Jesus does extraordinary things. And he kept doing extraordinary things through the apostle and he still does extraordinary things today. It is his continuing work through the apostles and through the church. So Peter knew what was going to happen and so he boldly could say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He could say, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I will give you, because he knew what would happen. Peter gave the man what he had. He gave the man a gift from God that was far more valuable than the silver or gold that he wanted. And, and God gives you gifts that are just as valuable. Remember the call on Pentecost was this, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's Acts 2, 38 and 39. So for you today, for us today, that means the Holy Spirit is for you. It is for you and your children. The Holy Spirit is for he is for those who are far off, and we are far off. It is for everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. So the Holy Spirit has empowered you, much like he empowered the apostles. 
with gifts to be used for the good of others and for his praise and for building up his church. So God had empowered Peter with the gift of healing. But if you notice one thing about that gift, it's not really primarily for Peter. It's for those he serves. It's for the lame man. It is for the people who see the lame man walking. It's not, it's not really for Peter. And our gifts, if we have them, or the gifts that we have because we all have them, are the same. They're not primarily for our good. Well, they're for our good, but they're not primarily for our good. They are for the good of others, for this family of disciples. God has empowered you with gifts for this church. They're for building up the church. They're for building up this church. They're for building up the people in this church. And every gift is important. Every single one. Here's an excerpt from that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So God empowers you by his Holy Spirit. Each one of you individually, just as he wills. So, so in some Christian circles, it is common to talk about spiritual gifts and, and think about spiritual gifts a lot. Um, some people, there, there are even out there something called spiritual gift assessments. Well, Peter didn't ever take one, right? He just did what the Lord led him to do. He gave what he had. So what is a spiritual gift anyway? Well, if, if you want to know, if you want to see lists, if you're a list person, you can look several places in the New Testament and find lists. But I don't think those lists are meant to be comprehensive. Here's the way Wayne Grudem, Wayne Grudem defines a spiritual gift. Any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in any ministry of the church. Any ability empowered by the Holy Spirit used in any ministry of the church. So, we just, we've seen that. We see that all the time here, right? We just saw it in, in Vacation Bible School. Any ability that God gives you in any ministry, and a lot of that happened here last week. Peter's gift of healing was worth far more than silver or gold. And you might be thinking, well, mine, mine just isn't that valuable. Well, Scripture would tell you not to think that way. Because though some gifts seem less important and less valuable, they only seem that way. Every gift is important. Every gift is worth far more than the silver and gold that the lame man wanted. Faith is a gift of the, is on one of those lists. Far more, worth far more than silver and gold. 
Serving, just serving, is a spiritual gift worth far more than silver and gold. Encouragement. I know we have people that are good at that. Encouragement. Far better than silver or gold. Words of wisdom worth far more than silver or gold. And if we look into the Old Testament, the ability to make things for service, to make things, is empowered by the Holy Spirit and worth far more than silver and gold. Any ability empowered by the Holy Spirit used in any ministry of the church. So when you're in a small church like Living Hope is now, it is pretty evident that everybody's gifts are valuable and needed and are more valuable than, than silver or gold. Living Hope is a small church. And so when I think about, think back on my, on my life and, it, and how valuable other people's gifts have been to me. I, I could come up with, with many, many examples. Most of those, other, other than that, well, most of them started, at least started when this was a really, really small church. Because when Pastor Randy came here, we had about 40 people. So we were smaller than Living Hope Evangelical Free Church as they moved to their new facility and I've, and I've often said that has been the most important thing that God has done in my life was bringing him here. But when I think back to other things that happen in a small church, I can think back and, and remember those who were there and their gifts. And so if you're one of those who is there, by the way, I'm not going to mention your name. <laughs> okay? I don't want to embarrass you. But when, when Gordy Carlson passed away, a couple years ago, I went up in, I went to see him in hospice. So I'd, I'd seen him in the nursing home a few times. And, and Pastor Randy's talked about this a lot, but he, right up till the last day there, was, was witnessing over 100 years old in the nursing home. Well, when I went to see him in, in hospice, he, I remember a couple of things he said to me. One of them was that, I, re, I met your grandfather 75 years ago, as, as they were, Gordy was in the church already, the, this church, Westside Evangelical Free Church at the time. And the other thing I remember is that Gordy explained to me how he taught adult Sunday school lessons, how he taught uh, adult Sunday school. So right up to hospice, he's using his gifts. for building up the church. But what I have, what I do have, I give to you. Peter's words are words of love. The scripture reading that Russ read this morning was 1 Peter 4, 8 to 11. It reads this way, above all, Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion 
forever and ever. Amen. So let Peter's words be your words. They were Gordy's words. But what I do have, I give to you. What Peter had was this. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. For the first time, the man stands up. He takes Peter's hand, and he's healed. So what good are silver and gold to a man like that? Our final point um, is this. Peter's gift leads the lame man to praise God. And leaping up, he stood up and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. So the formerly lame man, the walking and leaping and praising God man, didn't go home. He went into the temple, into the courts of the temple, into the inner courts of the temple for the first time in his life. He was lame from birth, and that would have prevented him from going into the inner courts of the temple. So he hangs on to Peter and John, and he goes in with Peter and John. He was healed. So we are like that lame man, that formerly lame man. We are beggars. This is true. But when we repent and are baptized, as it says in, in Acts 2, in the name of Jesus Christ, in his great name, for the forgiveness of our sins, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and we are healed. We get to go into the inner court. And we can go in walking and leaping and praising God. Verse 9, And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So notice how the people responded. They saw the man walking and praising God. And they are amazed by that. They're filled with wonder and amazement, it says. It was an extraordinary miracle. And the reason they were done that, it, that happened is because that's what it was supposed to do. Peter had given God's gift that was worth more than silver or gold to the lame man. He could walk. But he had another gift to give to the people, a gift that was better than silver and gold and better than a lame man walking. It was more valuable than that. It was meant to get people's attention. It was meant to get them to listen to this message. And later in, and this is what it says in, later in Acts chapter 3, but I'm just going to really abbreviate it for you. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Skip down a little bit. The faith that is through Jesus Christ has given the man his perfect health in the presence of you all. Skip down a little further. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Just like we talked about in our prayer this morning. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ that he is appointed for you, Jesus. So I'm going to ask the men who are going to serve communion to come forward now. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. So if, if that's your story, if, that, if you have done that, if you've repented and turned back and your sins have 
blotted out, then the table here is for you. Because this table with the bread and the juice represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed for you. And when we celebrate this, we're proclaiming his death until he comes. And so Paul, when he writes about this, says, but, but don't forget about this, to examine yourself. And as Pastor Randy often points out, you're examining yourself for faith and repentance. You're examining yourself to see if you have repented and turned back. Uh, and so if you have, the Lord's Supper is for, for you.